Welcome to the Upa Lupa Cafe, a place where storytellers gather, where old sailors relive their travels, where shamans and mystics reveal their esoteric secrets, where mammoth are hunted and cave walls are turned into art galleries. Some visitors here bring the detective skills of Sherlock Holmes. Some bring ancient tools found in the backyard. Some bring insights into how ancient people lived, loved, died, and were buried. Much of what you will see and hear in this place you won't find in a history book, but you should. This is the Upa Lupa Cafe, where the heroes of old come alive and legends live again. A place where history is exciting. A place where adventures begin. Come with us and explore. And welcome to the Oopa Loopa Cafe here on the 25th of January 2013. Happy Friday. We have a number of stories lined up for you today that I think will be of pretty good interest, high interest level for some of you at least, and very high interest for a few of you, I think. Now, one of the things that I promised to speak with you about today is the arrangement with Temerity Magazine runs out at the end of this month. They have been an absolutely wonderful group of contributors to the Oopa Loopa Cafe here for the last two months. And I wish them all the best success, not only with their treasure hunting and detecting, but also with their endeavors on video as well as the magazine. We're working on a couple of possible replacements for a daily series similar to what Temerity has been doing for us. But today, we have an interview with this guy, and his name is Dennis Stone, and he is the owner-operator of a place called America's Stonehenge. It's also been called Mystery Hill and a couple other things, but we'll talk about that briefly during the interview. Now, Dennis is here today but tonight, you can actually watch him on H2 with Scott Walter's show, America Unearthed. Now, I've been to Mystery Hill and enjoyed it, but again, we'll talk about that some during that interview with Dennis Stone. Another story that's coming up involves these guys, and it comes basically from a story that was published in the uh, Smithsonian Institution's magazine, Smithsonian. But I'm going to give you just a little bit different take on where they went with it because there's a lot more to the story about the pinks. And we also have a story about very old baby shoes. These are 2,000 year old baby shoes. And we have a follow up story about these Spitfires in Burma. And of course, we have our off the wall um, segment today. Uh, Wow. <laughs> All I can say was is that there was some fire flying back and forth between a couple of people yesterday. You'll see it. And, uh, and of course, we have one of the very last Temerity Magazine clips, at least for quite some time. We'll, we'll keep in touch with them. We're on good terms, but uh, it's... It's been a lot of work and um, maybe maybe a little extra effort went into it that might have been just a little too much effort. But for now, let's go back to the story about the Spitfires. Now, if you recall, a gentleman from England by the name of Cundell had, has been chasing these things for quite some years, actually. He had spoken to witnesses both in RAF as well as American Army Engineering Corps and even a few Burmese natives to try to determine the exact locations that these some 140 Spitfires were buried in Burma at the end of World War II. And the effort has been underwritten by Wargames.net, which is a Belarusian company with an American office don't know what the arrangement is there, but that's their business. 
However, it turns out that on January the 9th, they thought they had discovered one of the sites using ground penetrating radar and a few other things. They had detected metal, a concentration of metal in one of the spots that they thought was one of the spots. Well, it turns out that it was metal, but it wasn't metal airplanes. It was electrical wiring and plumbing and other piping that showed up on the ground penetrating radar in a very similar signature as would those airplanes. However, uh, they got another hit on what is certainly a large wooden crate, but it's full of water and mud and even if the airplanes are, or some parts of the airplanes are in there, it's probably severely damaged. But we will try to keep an eye on this so that we can keep you up to date with it. Now they had initially called a press conference for, I believe it was the 18th of January, but they canceled it at the last minute. Um, so don't know what's up with it exactly, but if there are 140 Spitfires out there any place, it's worth running that story to ground. And speaking of running stories to ground, that's kind of what our off the wall clip is about today. Running to ground exactly what happened in Benghazi. And this clip is an exchange between Rand Paul and Hillary Clinton. Thank you for appearing, Secretary Clinton, and I'm glad to see your health is improving. One of the things that disappointed me most about the original 9-11 was no one was fired. We spent trillions of dollars, but there were a lot of human errors. These are judgment errors, and the people who make judgment errors need to be replaced, fired, and no longer in a position of making these judgment calls. So we have a review board. The review board finds 64 different things that we can change. A lot of them are common sense and should be done, but the question is, it's a failure of leadership that they weren't done in advance, and four lives were cost because of this. I'm glad that you're accepting responsibility. I think that ultimately with your leaving, you accept the culpability for the worst tragedy since 9-11. And I really mean that. Had I been president at the time, and I found that you did not read the cables from Benghazi, you did not read the cables from Ambassador Stevens, I would have relieved you of your post. I think it's inexcusable. The thing is, is that, you know, we can understand that you're not reading every cable, I can understand that maybe you're not aware of the cable from the ambassador in Vienna that asked for $100,000 for an electrical charging station. I can understand that maybe you're not aware that your department spent $100,000 on three comedians who went to India on a promotional tour called Make Chi Not War. But I think you might be able to be understand and might be aware of the $80 million spent on a consulate in Mashar al-Sharif that will never be built. I think it's inexcusable that you did not know about this and that you did not read these cables. I would think by anybody's estimation, <clears throat> Libya has to have been one of the hottest of hot spots around the world. Not to know of the request for securities really, I think, cost these people their lives. Their lives could have been saved had someone been more available, had someone been aware of these things, more on top of the job. And the thing is, is I don't suspect you of bad motives. The review board said, well, these people weren't willfully neg negligent. I don't think you were willfully. I don't suspect your motives of wanting to serve your country. But it was a failure of leadership not to be involved. It was a failure of leadership not to know these things. And so I think it is good that you're accepting responsibility because no one else is. And this is, there is a certain amount of culpability to the worst tragedy since 9-11. And I'm glad you're accepting this. And now we take up the story after that little exchange, of a baby shoe. Now, this particular baby shoe happens to be very close to 1900 years old and was probably in left where it was found sometime between 117 AD and about 140 AD. They are still waiting for some of the testing to come back to get a, a better dating on that. But the place where it was found, 
this this shoe was found in close proximity to one of the quote unquote mile castles, a, a fortress type structure that is along Hadrian's Wall in northern England, or actually it kind of at the border of England and Scotland, kind of. Well, anyway, it's up there. We'll have a, <clears throat> another map here in just a moment for that. But this shot, this is part of Hadrian's Wall as it crosses the countryside. It's uh, close to 80 miles in its total run. And Hadrian's Wall, again, was started in 122 AD. And it is not known exactly what forces, what labor force was used to build Hadrian's Wall. However, <clears throat> it was certainly built under the Emperor Hadrian because there have been enough references to him found in association with it to, to make it a pretty done deal on that. Now, you can actually see the lower line here is Hadrian's Wall and the upper line is <clears throat> the Antonine Wall. And both of those <clears throat> were thought for many years to be a, a separation between the Picts and the rest of Great Britain. Now, here, here's another run of Hadrian's Wall as it crosses. But what was thought isn't always right. One of the other things that was thought was that all of the occupation of Hadrian's Wall and all of its associated mile castles and fortresses were all Roman soldiers. But yet there's a baby shoot. And it goes well beyond that because the baby shoe is actually a high or elite type shoe. So even for an infant, 10 centimeters, by the way, that's how long that shoe is. Um, a, a true baby shoe matched probably its father's shoes. And the father would have been a high-ranking, probably military officer, possibly some kind of a civil servant type. But uh, the walls that they used weren't all alike. Now, this particular image is actually a watchtower in Portugal. I showed it to you yesterday. And there are other structures along Hadrian's Wall that are even more mundane, enigmatic at first, but once you understand the purpose, they're kind of mundane, actually. For instance, this, this picture right here is actually a latrine, and it has running water through it pretty much all the time. Um, so it was a live-action sewage system, so to speak. But the inference that they had their babies with them, they had their entire families with them, and that these babies were out in public because there was no reason to dress an infant in a high-end, you know, Gucci-type shoe if it wasn't going out in public. And, of course, it was dressed up to look like Dad, most likely. Now, this particular image is at York, in Yorkshire. And the, below the red line is a Roman structure, and above the red line is a later structure, actually two or three different stages of construction after the Roman occupation. And there were all kinds of Roman um, artifacts and structures left all over the British Isles some 2,000 years ago. And in fact, they did a lot of different designs of fortresses as well as engines of war that were used in Britain and elsewhere. But the, the upshot of this, I guess, is did they actually export these technologies, these structural designs, and the overall militarism that they used all over the known Roman Empire? Well, maybe. Now, this image is actually... London, or the blue line is the Roman wall that can still be traced throughout the city of London. And one 
of the uh, stations for the tube, you know, the Underground Railroad subway, but they call it the tube. One of the stations, you come out of the tube and there's a Roman wall, like the 2,000 year old section of stone wall built by the Roman occupation. So, is there any connection between that and possibly this? Now, this wall section is within the HTN21 viewing area. And I can't tell because I don't have the skills and or laboratory equipment and or money to pay for the laboratory work to find out the exact age of this wall. But it is in Martin County and uh, it belongs to a guy who asked me to come out and look at it after he read an article I did in Ancient American Magazine. Is there enough similarity between this type of wall and the ancient Roman walls to actually make it a hypothesis rather than just a stupid guess? Well, not yet, but we're working on that. There is some evidence that this is truly an ancient wall. It remains to be seen if the Romans had anything to do with it. In our next segment, we take up the story of the failed assassination attempt on Abraham Lincoln and how it was foiled by the Pinkerton Agency. Stick with us. And welcome back to the Oopa Loopa Cafe. Here in segment two, we have our story about the failed assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Well, really, it's more about why it failed. You see, upon his inauguration, Lincoln only had one way into Washington, D.C., and that was via a railroad. And that railroad suspected there was going to be trouble, and they hired some detectives to try to sniff out who the troublemakers were going to be. Now, all of this story is actually in, in this issue of Smithsonian Online, smithsonian.com. And the title is The Unsuccessful Plot to Kill Abraham Lincoln. Well, the detective agency that was hired by the railroad to infiltrate the um, sympathizers in Maryland, Baltimore in particular, the railroad hired the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Now, from that first graphic, you saw that the Pinkerton's logo was the all-seeing eye. Well, they weren't quite all-seeing, but they were pretty effective. They could have hung their sign out that said, Spies Are Us. But they were successful in snipping out the plot that would probably have killed Abraham Lincoln, as well as damaged a lot of the railroad's into Washington, D.C., which would have set back the war effort quite a bit once the war actually started. Now, the Pinkerton Agency had been around since 1850, so it wasn't a new thing for the Pinks to enter into plots or actually to spy on plotters. You see, they started out in Chicago, they knew about plots. Of course, in Chicago, most of the plots were the politicians themselves. Nevertheless, the Pinkerton Agency had already gained quite a reputation by 1861. By 1867, um, it was a little bit tarnished, but Pinkerton had made good on the reputation of having saved Lincoln's life. And this particular image shows that they actually had the Star of David on their shield. No one knows why, because Pinkerton was a Scotsman. At any rate, the Pinkerton Agency, during the Civil War, had actually gone to break um, some of the 
Raiders, and th this isn't the bunch that went, we don't think, we're not sure, but Pinkerton himself had taken it upon himself to go break the James Gang. Well, they weren't the James Gang then. At, at, okay, yeah, they were the James Gang. But they had been with, Frank had been with Quantrell's Raiders. Um, Frank and Jesse had both, both been riding with a number of Southern sympathizers. Now, this guy is actually Butch Cassidy, John Longball. And another target for Mr. Pinkerton. But back to the whole Jesse James thing. You see, before Jesse could recover from one of the wounds he received, he had been um, subjugated to some torture, as well as, as well as had his stepfather. His stepfather was actually hanged. Um, then after the war, when they were in full gangster mode, the Pinkertons agency, as well as Alan Pinkerton himself, engaged in a little bit of uh, illegal activity. They threw a smoke bomb into the house where Jesse's mom and his half-brother lived. It was supposed to be a smoke bomb, an incendiary, but it exploded. It killed his younger half-brother, and it blew his mom's arm off. Well, she was a strong woman. She went on a long time. But it also, that action galvanized Jesse James and Frank James and everybody who lived around there against not only the Pinkerton Agency, but also against the federal government who had hired them to go find out what was going on with the James Gang. Um, now, history tells you that it was the railroads who hired the Pinkertons. But the reality is, the government had a long-standing, uh, what we would call today, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract with the Pinkerton Agency to do things like this. Because, first of all, they didn't have an FBI. They didn't have enough of a Secret Service to actually carry out this type of job. The Pinkertons also broke a lot of unions. They broke a lot of strikes, I should say. They, and they broke a few unions, too. And it was for hire, not all by the businesses that were being struck. Sometimes it was by government itself. Until there was a law entitled the Anti-Pinkerton Act that said that the government, nor the government of the District of Columbia, could hire the Pinkertons or similar agencies to carry out such work as strike breaking. So strike breakers weren't a, a good thing, at least not in the eyes of the union. And they did, the Pinkertons did a very effective job of breaking strikes. They broke minor strikes in Idaho. They, well, they, they broke a lot of strikes. And they did it by infiltrating the union itself, usually ended up being an officer within the union, even secretary of the union. Um, so they not only knew what was going on, they got to write down all the notes. Wow, pretty effective stuff. So in essence, they were, um, I guess you'd have to say, they were spies for the U.S. government. And they were also mercenaries for the U.S. government. At any rate, the Pinkerton Agency, what a crew. More treasures, not from history so much. Well, okay, maybe from history. This is one of our last Temerity Magazine clips. Please enjoy it. I'll be back in a moment. Hi, this is Chad Everson, and this is Temerity Magazine. We come to you with two segments of Relic and Treasure Hunters from across the world every day on Rick Osmond's new Palupa Cafe. Don't forget about our on, online and in print magazine. You can find it at temeritymag.com. Join us as an author. January 20th is our deadline for submissions. And all you have to do is email, email those submissions, photos, uh, and links to your videos too, because we're always looking for people with temerity 
that can share their passion for this great addiction, who knows, you might see yourself right here. Please send it to editor at temeritymagazine.com and I hope you're getting inspired, Indiana, to get a little grizzly right in your own grizzly backyard because you have an amazing history there and it's just weird. This is Cowboy Bart from Wyoming. I hope you enjoy my programs. I got a book out there too, four of them, Ancient Ghost, books one, two, three, and four at ancientghost.com. All right, now I want to talk about another symbol. Back over here behind me, if you can see it, it looks like a four fingers. They've been cut off, kind of look like that. Below them is what appears to be like a thumb or a rest part of another finger. You can see the nail back over in here. As you move along these cliffs, that piece is cut off, moves from joint to joint to joint. As you move along here, it actually, it doesn't really move, but as you move, your different view allows it to move. And what it means is look between the fingers or at the fingertip. So what we got here is we got two choices between the fingers or we can look down the mountain, which we're not going to do, it'll give away my sight. Uh, there's actually four fingers coming down this mountain. At the bottom is the piece that's missing. So I've actually got two from up here. The one at the bottom, that's one there. We've scanned that. There's stuff there. And then up here in these cliffs, on the side of one of the cliffs, there's a set of two fingers as well. Even on my map, which we're going to go check out here in a few minutes, there's another set of fingers. Also, previously I talked about a horse, and I kind of drew out the legs and the back and the head. But a lot of it is lay of the land, and uh, it's how, how you're, what angle you're looking at it from and how you perceive things. And we're obviously we're at the wrong angle on purpose, but that's okay. But you fan kind of a little bit to the right, just fan over there toward that red hill, and then fan back, and then come back. Don't take forever, give away too much. Anyway, <laughs> that red hill over there is the ears on that burrow or that pony. There's two of them over there, they were put there. That's not natural. All that dirt was carried there. In fact, down below this mountain, there are ridges that's are spoils from when they were digging, when they created this place. And the, the flat part up there is actually the horse. So you got two points and a flat part is what they're portraying. But in the picture they're showing it kind of like this. But in all reality it's more like this. They're giving you more clues on where to look. Yep, uh, I'd just like to say I hope you enjoyed my little programs for you. And Maybe you uh, saw something you didn't see before and might work with your own sights or maybe even give you ins inspiration to uh, go out and look on your own. Um, I really enjoy this. I've been doing this for quite a while. Pretty good at what I do. I've, I've hunted in New Mexico, Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. And uh, so, I, so I travel around. i got quite a few good places. But anyway, this is Cowboy Bart. I'm with Temerity Magazine and Oompa Loompa Cafe. And you can find me on ancientghost.com. Later, dudes. Well, coming up in our next segment, we will have the interview with Dennis Stone of Mystery Hill, a.k.a. America's Stonehenge. And it is quite an interesting event, I think, 
you know, it's a, just a little 10 minute or so interview. Yet we disclose a lot of information about some unknown ancient culture that built some really enigmatic structures near what is now Salem, New Hampshire. Dennis is also a commercial pilot and is nearing retirement age in that profession. I have to admire that, all the hours spent. It's an amazing profession. At any rate, he's also the owner-operator of Mystery Hill, and I hope you'll come back for segment three here on today's Oopa Loopa Cafe, the 25th of January, 2013. We're going to have a ball. Be back in just a minute. Okay, so this is Rick Osmond here on the Oopa Loopa Cafe, joined on the phone by Dennis Stone of um, Mystery Hill, aka American Stonehenge, and been called a few other things in the past, right? Oh, that's correct, sir. That's right. I had many names over the years. And it had a lot of mysteries the entire time. Um, we won't cram all the history into the time that we have here today but it is uh, a very ancient site. I think you've got carbon dates back 4,000, 4,500 years, someplace in that arena. No, that's correct. The earliest one on the main site is about 4,000 years, and we've taken about 16 different carbon datings since 1966 on the site. Wow. That's not the most mysterious part, not its age, but the age combined with what it really is is amazing because it is an arrangement of stones for the most part um, that follow a lot of astronomical events. Is that fair to say? Uh, that is correct, yes it is. It's an astronomical site, that's for sure, yep. It's And it also has what most people refer to as what a sacrificial table, but it's an enigmatic stone. <laughs> uh, yes, that's one of the main features of the site is a bell-shaped slab of stone that weighs about four and a half tons and it has a rectangular groove carved on the surface of it and the stone is adjacent to the biggest structure on, at America Stonehenge called the Oracle Chamber. Uh, that's because there's this tube that goes from the Oracle Chamber six feet to a wall and it comes out underneath the table and it's believed during a ceremony of some type with a table people standing above the table looking down at it would hear their voice coming out from the tube and you cannot tell there's a big chamber behind it. It's all underground. It's kind of concealed, but the table's right in front of you. And uh, you hear his voice, and you might think it's like a god or spirit talking to you during a ceremony. So it's pretty It's pretty neat. The table sits on four legs. Yep. And, um, yeah, it's about nine feet by six feet total uh, size of the table. It's, very, it's quite large. It is. Um, and it's mm -hmm. also in its own little, I don't know, terraformed area, I guess, because it's, it's dug out to some degree, or it looked to me like it had been modified, had already been a dip in the ground. But speaking of dips in the ground, another enigmatic stone is actually a small piece of quartz, um, white quartz, right? Well, there's a well uh, in the uh, site. It's well it goes down at about 23 feet in the bottom part of it. In the area. It gets kind of large at the bottom. And my dad, in 1963, went down in a ladder. I guess he was one of the first people to get down there, and they cleaned out the debris in there and found a, it looked like a vein of quartz crystal at the bottom of the well. And there's no spring of water that goes into it. The only, only water in there is when we have snow or rain and it, uh, the snow melts in there. And um, it's kind of a mysterious hole in the ground, basically, 20, about 23 feet uh, deep, and that's where the uh, quartz was. So some people suggest there was a mine shaft for taking these quartz crystals out of there and they're used from some sort of ceremonial purposes, perhaps. That's that's a theory, basically. Yeah, and it's one yeah. other feature that I found there that I haven't found that you highlighted anywhere in the literature or website or anything, but there is a triangular-shaped hole in one of the stones um, 
I, I can't get my bearings right, but not too far from the well, actually. Oh, oh, that's correct. Yeah, it's right. It's probably about ten feet from the well, and uh, this one around 1969, they were doing some uh, excavations and cleaning of that area, and they found the, the triangular-shaped hole that goes right through the rock, and around that hole is a circle actually etched into the stone. It's probably about uh, about 18 inches in diameter. This this circle, and there's been a lot of speculation too as to the purpose. This this hole does look a little bit like. Um, uh, Scott Walters, I think you're familiar with Scott mm -hmm. yep. uh, in his research, and he was up this summer, and uh, we're looking at that again, and it's a little bit larger than what he calls a Viking uh, mooring hole, although they weren't all used for that purpose, uh, but it's very similar to that. It that is very of, uh, similar to that, yeah. yeah uh, yeah. In the same year that I was at your place, I had been out in Minnesota and South Dakota looking at those. Ah, mm -hmm. and hmm. And also went to Norway and found one in Bergen. Oh, wow. The one in Bergen's actually been backfilled with lead and has an iron mooring ring in it. Hmm, that's interesting. But it's now uh, 20 or 30 feet from the water because they build up Bergen, the harbor, a lot. But oh, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. still in the same place where it was depicted in a, I believe it was a 1506 painting of Bergen Harbor. Bergen Fjord. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was, it was kind of neat to find that. But back to Scott Walter and Mystery Hill. So if he's been up there and I'm guessing he's taken his film crew, etc. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, he was up uh, twice this year. Cool. And they did a six day filming up there. And uh, it was very exciting to have him there. And in the new, in the brand new show that he's um, on, a new series. I believe it's going to be 13 parts, and it's already on the air. Yep. And our episode is coming up on Friday. It'll be on Friday. Um, yep. And and uh, it'll be at 10 o'clock in the evening at East Coast time, America on Earth. And uh, the title I saw it's something about Stonehenge, of course. And I can't remember the exact title, but that will be us at 10 o'clock Eastern time. Excellent. So the other thing I wanted to bring up is that. This time of year, when it's not really all that nice to go wandering through the woods at Mystery Hill, you kind of make up for it. And do you still have snowshoe tracks and trails? Oh yeah, we, yeah. Actually, this time of year, it's actually it actually is really nice in a way. It's uh, no mosquitoes, and you can see a lot because the leaves are off the trees. You can see a lot of the walls. Yeah. The whole hilltop is covered with walls. Uh, some of them at the bottom might be more historic, say starting in the 1750s when a lot of wall building. But others on top of them will have a lot of big slab work in them, and we think these are more of the ancient walls that are built by these people. And in these walls, we have the astronomical uh, stones uh, for mm -hmm. many, you know, the different seasons for both the, the sun. Uh, we have the lunar alignments, and we have the uh, uh, we have 24 star alignments too that was found by the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in 1977. They looked at our survey. Uh, data that we did from 73 to 1977, and they said we had 24 star alignments too. But um, you can see a lot up there. We open up the, hot, the 110 acres, including an area that's a cliff area that's off limits during the summer, in spring and fall. But in the wintertime, we open that up, and it's where Native Americans were actually living under this glacial cliff shelter. It's really beautiful wow. out there, and we found pottery that dated around 2000 to 2,500 years old, middle woodland period pottery, and it's just a real pretty area, which you don't see normally unless you go up there in the wintertime, so that's kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah, that's the part I missed because I was there in the summertime. But Yeah, we come back in the winter and we do candlelight snowshoeing too on Saturdays, which is really beautiful. Wow. I think next weekend we're planning on that next Saturday night. So. And just so people but. know, you also have a small menagerie. Oh, we do. <laughs> Right, yeah, we do. <laughs> and it looks like they came from uh, Star Wars, I think. A lot of people think that they're... Uh, <laughs> but they're, uh, we have uh, eight alpacas at this time, and uh, they're actually from South America, but what most people don't know is they're actually a North American animal. Their ancestors are from North America, and they go back about 45 million years, up yeah. to about eight uh, years ago. And so that's part of our educational thing, too. You know, at one time, uh, these animals were roaming the landscape. Their ancestors were of North America, our oldest carbon dating outside the main site near the Moorstone was 7,500 years old. 
Wow. And so that was very close to the time that these animals were still in North America before they came extinct. But somebody was on the hilltop at that time building a campfire. It doesn't date the site or the walls, but they, we did find a fire pit. So human activity does go back over 7,000 years ago on that hill. Wow. Which kind of, so a long time, you know, many different uh, people, different cultures up there, including the stone builders. Yeah. Well, and you've had a number of theories, uh, hypotheses, and a couple of wild speculations, but as to explain who those people were. But one of the most intriguing I that I've heard came from someone who had seen the site plan and said there should be another stone right there and it should be this tall. Mm -hmm. And he later found out that that was the stone that had been broken and part of it is now at the visitor center. All right, right, yeah. Uh, they predicted correctly, but if in that case, yep, uh, yeah, that's renewed, kind of the, renewed Dijon. But uh, yeah, that was that's a priori. He predicted that there should be another stone this tall, but the site plan doesn't list it because it had been broken and moved. So that's correct. Yeah, yeah, that's that is really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, anyway, Dennis, I hope everybody will tune in Friday, 10 p.m. Eastern. And I hope they can all get up there for a Saturday night candlelight snowshoeing outing, because I will bet it's beautiful. It is beautiful, Rick. Yeah, I hope you can see that. It's uh, it's really nice. Well, I hope I can make it one of these days. Oh, well, you're certainly invited back. Hope to see you again. And thank you so much for uh, letting me uh, talk with you this evening. Don't you like Scott? Oh, he's a wonderful guy. Yeah, I've met him several times over the last four or five years, and we're actually very, very pleased. Uh, my dad passed away three years ago, and Scott yep. was a member of uh, the New England Antiquities Research Association. My dad started in '64, and he's got his own TV show now. That's kind of kind of neat. But, yeah. uh, my dad uh, passed away before that happened. Well, I'm sorry for that loss, but I am very, very pleased that he worked so diligently to get it uh, get its awareness raised, just kind of like we're doing right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I think of him all the time, and I think he'd be quite pleased with the way. Uh, some of these things are coming out now, you know, with people becoming aware of these sites, and because of shows like yours, it's been a very big help educating the public. Well, I certainly hope that's it, because um, that's the aim, obviously. Dennis, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have to cut it down, and uh, we'll get you back on when you transition from snowshoes to mosquito repellent. Well, thank you. I have to go through mud season first, but uh, thank you so much, Rick, and uh, you have a nice night. Thank you again for letting me uh, talk to your listeners. Thank you very much. You bet. Well, I sure had fun doing that interview with Dennis Stone. And I kind of envy him being on the show with Scott, although I think I'll get my turn one of these days. That's, that's not a done deal. But Scott's success already with this show, four or five, six episodes in, whatever they are, uh, is, is astounding. And they have uh, gotten the green light for next season, so... More power to Scott Walter, Maria, and Andy Oz of Committee Films, who uh, made, a, made it all happen. Now, Scott's obviously the person in front of the camera. They're the people behind the camera and on the keyboard and on the phone and doing all the things that producers must do. And they're fine people, incidentally. I've met both of them as well. They... Uh, they also worked with Scott on his special for the History Channel, The Holy Grail in America, which was the History Channel's choice of title, incidentally. So it's kind of interesting watching all that from the sidelines because I know what it takes to actually produce a television show, as you might guess. The, <laughs> the upshot of it is there are enough people watching that it's gratifying to know that um, I guess I've, I've been pushing some buttons from my end but the general audience is out there and there is enough of it to support this type of programming. Now on that note send me an email if you like this type of programming if you have some kind of an artifact or a strange site or a really interesting historic site that you would like for me to come and film, get footage, and talk about on the air, then all you have to do is send an email to oopaloopacafe at gmail.com. 
See, I got it out right that time without any slip-ups. But the this show, as well as Scott's show to some degree, is all about people. Yeah, you know, the stuff, the finds, the artifacts, those are important. But what's really important is the people. Because it is the people that keep it interesting. And on that note, I need to... Uh, inform you, I guess, that I am a an advisor to the Ancient Artifact Preservation Society, which is headquartered in Marquette, Michigan. And still going back to one of Scott's shows, the one about the copper, Judy Johnson is the secretary, and I think uh, Glenn Devlamic is currently the president. The organization has set out to preserve that giant piece of copper that you may or may not have seen in, in Scott's show, America Unearthed. However, they're kind of short on the money. They had a, a large donor that could not come through with all of it in the right timely fashion. So now they're actually vying with another preservation organization uh, to hold ownership of that giant piece of copper because it sure would be a shame for that to get turned into scrap metal someplace. But it could happen. So from time to time you will see small snippets about AAPS, Ancient Artifact Preservation Society, on this show. And I've had a long-standing association with them long enough that they put me on the Board of Advisors. And uh, they're a good bunch of folks. They put on a really good conference every fall as well. Uh, typically end of September. I don't know the dates for 2013, but when I do know them, I will certainly pass them along. And one last note before we get out of here today. Be sure and tune in Monday for the interview with Cindy Cash Dollar, formerly of Asleep at the Wheel, and has appeared with everybody from Willie Nelson to Bob Dylan, Leon Redbone, Junior Brown. Well, I can't recite that entire list here. Just tune in Monday, Oopa Loopa Cafe. I'm out of here.